Good morning. Man, who's excited to be alive today? You know, I, I am kind of disappointed, though. It's a sunrise service, and the sun clearly isn't rising very well for us today. But that's all right. God is good, right? All right. Well, I'm so glad to be here this morning. Uh, we'll get this up here real quick. So we're just going to talk real briefly, um, because I know everybody's hungry for breakfast, right? Some, yes. They made a really awesome breakfast. I was looking at some of it. Anybody ever heard of uh, French toast casserole? Yeah. Never in my life. Never heard of it. But it sounds amazing and looks amazing, so I'm excited for it. But anyway, <laughs> Lord, I thank you for this day. God, I thank you that we can come into your house to worship the risen Savior. Jesus, we are so thankful for everything you've done for us. We are so thankful, Lord, that you went to the cross, that you died, that you were buried, and three days later, Lord, we, we are so thankful that you rose from that grave, that you defeated sin and death. So today, we give you all the glory as we come into your house to worship you, to hear from you, to listen to your word. God, we give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to talk real briefly about uh, the curtain in the temple, in the, the tabernacle of the holy people in Israel. They, the, the temple itself, the tabernacle, was separated into three sections, which I love talking about the tabernacle, so I'm going to try just to stay on the curtain because there's a lot of amazing stuff in there that, that uh, we see Jesus throughout the whole thing, but we'll focus just on the curtain for this morning. That way we can get done before breakfast is done. Um, but I want to talk about that curtain, and the first thing that we have to talk about is why was there a curtain in the first place in the temple? Um, and we are going to go to Hebrews 9, 1 through 9. Uh, it says, now even the first covenant had regulations for worship and an earthly place of holiness. For a tent was prepared, the first section in which were the lampstand and the table and the bread of presence. It is called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was the second section called the most holy place, having the golden altar of incense and the ark of the covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden urn holding the manna and Aaron's staff that bud it and the tablets of the covenant. Above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot now speak in detail. These preparations having thus been made, the priests go regularly into the first section performing their ritual duties. But into the second only the high priest goes, and he but once a year, and not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the unintentional sins of the people. By this the Holy Spirit indicates that the way into the holy place is not yet opened as long as the first section is still standing which is symbolic for the present, present age. According to this arrangement, gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the conscience of the worshiper. So for thousands of years, what we had is people coming to the tabernacle and making these sacrifices over and over and over again. And then once a year, on the Day of Atonement, the high priest would come into the tabernacle and he would make a sacrifice for his own sins and then for the sins of the entire nation. So there was a lot that weighed on that one Day of Atonement. Um, but in order to get to the Holy of Holies, which was behind this thick curtain, he had to go through that curtain to get to it. And it was not a place that you went in just all willy-nilly. You, you had to be in a good spot. He had to be cleared of his sins in order to even enter into that place. To the point where they, tradition says, they would tie a rope around the, the high priest's ankle before he would even go in. And they would have uh, little bells on his ankles. And if they heard those bells stop, they would yank that rope out because he was probably dead. That's how strict this thing was. So you didn't just walk into the presence of God back then. But this curtain was there as a physical barrier, which re represented the very real separation between man and God. It was there to keep us from the presence of God because of the curse that Adam and Eve brought on the entire world when they took that first sin. So we had no way to come into the presence of God. We couldn't just walk into it. Isaiah 59, 1 through 2 says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, or his ear dull that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he does not hear. So the sad fact was that our sin did, in fact, separate us from God. There was no way into his presence. As much as people brought these sacrifices and they would sacrifice these things on a daily basis, on a regular basis, like they, they'd, they might lie that day, so they bring a whole cow in to sacrifice for their lie, and then they go back out and they sin again and got to bring another sacrifice in again. It was a constant thing over and over and over again. And because of that, there was no way for them to be fully cleansed enough to where they could enter into the presence of God. 
they paid the penalty of sin, but it was just for a temporary time. It wasn't for all of their sin. So then the curtain rips. Matthew 27, 50 through 51 says, And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks split. So at the moment that Jesus gave up his life, now this curtain wasn't like your living room curtain. It wasn't something that you could see through. It wasn't something you just push to the side very easily. This thing was big, and it was thick. The only way to rip this thing was literally the hands of God taking it and ripping it in half. And that's exactly what happened. When Jesus gave up his life, that curtain was taken and just ripped straight in half so that the presence of God would be free for everyone that would come to, to Jesus. So I imagine the shock and complete awe of the Pharisees as they were going about their regular duties that day. They're just doing everything they normally do, and all of a sudden the earth starts shaking, and this curtain just rips in half. And they're, for the first time, a lot of them are looking at the, the mercy seat. They're looking into the Holy of Holies, and they're like, what do we do? We can't go in there, but now we can see the whole thing. And I'm sure there was a lot of shock and all that went into that um, because they weren't allowed in there, and yet here it is, wide open. So then why was the curtain split? Hebrews 9, 11 through 15 says, But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered once and for all into the holy place, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Therefore, he is a mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. So when the, when the curtain ripped, it was showing that we were no longer separated from God. That, that physical barrier was no longer there. And for the Pharisees, they might not have understood that, but that's exactly what was happening. When that physical barrier was ripped, it was showing that the spiritual barrier was ripped. Because when Jesus said on the cross, it is finished, it literally was finished. Which means that now we have access to the presence of God. We have access to walk boldly into the throne of grace. We're not separated from that anymore. That means that no matter what you do in life, no matter the, the sins that you commit, no matter the things that you think hold you back, you can just say, Lord, forgive me, and then walk boldly into the presence of God. There's nothing holding you back anymore. But people try to put that barrier back up. For some reason, we think we need to have that barrier because we're not good enough for God's presence. But God said, of course, first of all, you're not ever going to be good enough. But I said, I sent my son so that you wouldn't have to be, and yet you can still come. Hebrews 4.16 says, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Ripping that curtain symbolized the breaking of the, the curse so that we were afforded grace to come boldly into the presence of God. And it was sin that separated us, but it was Christ surrendering his life and his, his blood that covered our sins that allowed that thing to be broken down. Now, of course, that wasn't enough because the thing that God likes to do is we think, well, that would have been enough. But God says, no, I need to do more. I need to do more. Because he loves us that much that things that we might not think about, he says, I need to make sure this is right too. I need to fix this and this and this and this. So Friday night, Jesus is crucified. The light of the world goes out. And then Saturday, all hope is lost. And I think a lot about Saturday. Nobody talks about it very much. We talk about Monday, Thursday. We talk about the, the Last Supper. We talk about the crucifixion on Friday. We talk about the resurrection on Sunday. But no, no one really talks too much about Saturday. Saturday was an off day. Saturday we call silent Saturday. Because what happened is that the disciples and everybody that was following Jesus, they probably woke up that day and were hoping that it was all a dream. They were hoping that maybe... Jesus didn't actually get crucified, and none of it was real, and he's actually just waiting out there for them. But they woke up, and their hope is gone. For the moment, they have no hope. And then I think about heaven, and I think about how quiet it must have been as all the angels in all of heaven are standing there just watching the tomb. They know what's about to happen. 
but they're just standing there in anticipation. And then I think about hell and how hell must have been quiet. Because even though hell probably thought, yeah, we, we've won. We, we defeated the king. We beat him. They probably also heard what Jesus said when he was on the earth. And they don't know the whole story. They don't know what's about to happen next. So they heard what he said, and I'm sure they're standing there just staring, watching that tomb. So everything's quiet for just a moment as everybody watches in anticipation to see if maybe Jesus said the right thing. Maybe his words were true. Or did we actually just lose the king? Because we, don't, we didn't have the knowledge. Now we can look at the whole story. We look at Friday. We call it Good Friday because we know that Sunday is on its way. But then it was not good. Saturday was a terrible day for so many people. But then we know that Sunday came. Luke 24, 1 through 7 says, But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices that had pre- they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of, our, of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. As they were frightened, uh, and as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but he has risen. Remember how he told you while he was in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified on the third day. Rise. And on the third day, rise. He is risen. That's what we live by today. We live by the fact that our, our King, our Lord, our Savior, defeated sin, and then he defeated the impossible and defeated death. And he rose from that grave. He got up from his, his bed that was in there, took off those burial clothes and folded them nicely at the end of the bed, and then pushed that rock away and came walking out on his own. He brought himself back to life, and he was risen so that he could defeat death for us. Now, like I said, Jesus always says it's not enough. He always says there's one more thing I got to do. There's one more thing. There's one more thing. Because it's not enough just to defeat this or just to defeat this. He has so much more for us beyond that. Sometimes we forget that. Now, in the Passover meal, there's a part of the Passover where they say, uh, they go through this little thing that's called Deyanu. And it literally means it would have been enough. So we're going to practice that today. But we're going to go through the Christian version, if that's okay. They went through their Jewish history. We're going to go through what Jesus did for us. And after every line that I say, what I want you to do is say, it would have been enough. If you get excited about it, shout it. Let's go. (laughs) Go ahead and stand up with me for a minute if you can. And the worship team is going to get ready to come back up here, and we're going to get right back into worship after this, and then we'll go eat. So after every line... I want you to say, or if you can, shout it as loud as you can. It would have been enough. You ready? If he had forgiven our transgressions and had not loved us, if he had not loved us and had not, or if he would have loved us and had not adopted us as sons, if he had adopted us as sons and not given us an inheritance, if he had given us an inheritance and not given us the Holy Spirit. If he had given us the Holy Spirit and not blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. If he had not uh, made known to us the mystery of his will and had, and, or if he had made known to us the mystery of his will and had not made us alive with Christ. If he had made us alive in Christ and had not raised us with Christ. If he had not raised us with Christ and had, or if he, gosh, I keep saying not. If he had raised us with Christ and had not seated us with Christ. If he had seated us with Christ and had not created us uh, for good works in Christ Jesus. If he had created us for good works and had not purposed to show the surpassing riches of his grace toward us in Christ Jesus in the age to come. If he had brought us who were far off near by the blood of Christ and had not established peace. If uh, If he had established peace and had not made us fellow citizens, members of God's household. If he had made us fellow citizens, had not broken down the dividing wall between Jew and Gentile. If he had broken down the dividing wall between Jew and Gentile and had not given us both access to the Father and the Spirit, who is able to do more than we ask for or think. 
if he had given us both access to the Father and had not made us a holy temple, a dwelling of God in the Spirit, it would have been enough. enough. Everything that he did along the way would have been enough, but he always took it one step further to make sure that we had everything that we need. Because in our eyes, it would have been enough, but God said it wasn't enough. And that's why he pushed that stone out of the way, and he said it wasn't enough, but we're going to take it a step further. So let's pray. Lord, I thank you that we can come together. Lord, I thank you once again that you are the risen Savior. I thank you, Lord, that you said it was not enough. It was not enough for us to walk around in the desert without you. It was not enough for us to just have you in a tabernacle. It was not enough uh, for us just to be saved from our sins. It was not enough for you just to defeat the grave. But you sent everything to us, Lord, because you wanted the, to have the, the perfect place for us to be. You wanted us to be in a great relationship with you. So you just continue and continue and continue to show us your goodness, Lord. So I thank you, Jesus, for all that you do for us, all that you've done for us, and all that you're going to do. Lord, we give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen.